morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right. How's everybody doing? Ready to worship? Yeah? Ready to seek the Lord and get a little more strengthened? Amen. Would you all stand with me? Father, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life. We thank you for this beautiful weather that you have given us, Lord. And we give you, uh, we give thanks for this building that, uh, that we can come together in your name and glorify your name, Lord, and, and see our family. Father, we ask that you just bless this service in a special way, Lord. We ask that you strengthen our pastor as he brings the word and anoint his lips, Lord, because we know that our hearts are ready to receive whatever message you have given him to give us, Lord. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all worship together. Amen. Amen. Is it 
Thank you. 
before I took my vacation, <laughs> um, I was in, I was on vacation in Renown. It was a place of renown. I don't know if you've ever been there. It just, uh, you know, they have very expensive uh, motels there. But anyways, uh, we uh, we enjoyed our stay, uh, but we enjoyed leaving much better. And uh, so, uh, what what I was doing when I left. As I had started preaching out of the book of Acts, the birth of the church, now I was on the growth of the church. The church is growing. And I told you I'm going to continue that and I'm going to insert some other things as I come off, go along. Is that all right with you? Amen. Amen. I've got all the time in the world. So Jesus comes. My last sermon is going to be when he blows that trumpet. Amen. I'm going to be preaching on the way up. <laughs> See you later, world. Goodbye, world. Goodbye. That's going to be my theme song. Amen. But uh, I want to look at, read a couple of verses where we left off. You think I don't have that good of memory? I don't, but I've got it written down. <laughs> and so, and I've got Sean's stuff. I can't, I can't read his writing. That's why I always have him re type up his assignments. In terms of Amen. James chapter 1. I'm going to read from three different versions. Not all at the same time. But I want you to get this verse in your heart. And sometimes we get it better, perhaps when it's written just a little bit differently. Am I endorsing one or the other? No, I don't. I can't give you your preference. I know what I like, and I, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a Greek scholar, but I know how to use a lexicon. So I know when it's right on and when it's a little off. There are some I won't use. Okay? Enough said. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 7. When you get there, say amen. amen. Did, you, did she give you a list, my brother? Okay, you can, you can keep up with it. Yeah, you can. Part of it's from last week. Uh, let's, I'm going to do King James Version first. And that's very close. You can leave that. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. I'm going to do it from the NIV now. Do we have that in there? All right. But when you ask, you must believe not and not doubt. Because one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. I, I want you to focus on the one part there that says, ask in faith, nothing wavering. The NIV, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Now we'll read it in the NLT. Is, do we have that one? But when you ask, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person without, with divided loyalty is unsettled as a wave. And the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Now, I don't know why you're is reading a little different than mine, but that's okay. I'm going to read another version. But when you ask, when you ask God, be sure that you really expect. Amen. And I want you to write that verse down in your mind. When you ask God, 
really expect him to answer. Amen. Thank you, Lord. A few years ago when I came to this church, I, I changed a few things around. Not because, hey, I wanted to do away with the stuff that was here. We just built on the foundation that someone else laid. Tremendous work has been here for years. I appreciate all of our former pastors. Amen. I really do. Uh, you know, Pastor Brett was here for, I think, 17 years. Jerry Witten was here for 13 years. I don't remember. I don't remember them all. Uh, Pastor Ron here has been here for a while. Uh, but I changed things. One of the things I did is I measured a cross chair on the back. I didn't want to move the cross because this is the area I'd like it. So how much room did I have going all the way across? Then I went down to Staples and said, would you make me a sign this big? And I wanted to say, expect God. Amen. Expect God. And that's what James was saying. Expect God. Expect God to answer. Now, last week I shared a couple of things, or two weeks ago, or three, I don't know, three weeks ago. How many remember that? Pat only, okay. <laughs> so I've got an opportunity. I don't have a problem. I have an opportunity. You get to hear some of it again. Oh, sorry, Sean. I'll pick that up later. <coughs> I'm having a hard time because I'm not used to having this here. I'm used to holding it. I'm going to try that. It's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to break old habits. How many know that? Yeah. And ever since I was a kid, a priest holding a bike. Does this bother you? No. You okay with this, Brother Ed? Can I do this? All right. <laughs> Thumbs up. But I shared with you what that word expect means. It means to look forward to the occurrence of something with little reservation. Now I'm going to go a little bit deeper into that meaning in a moment. But I told you, you know what to expect. You know when to expect something. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I gave you one three weeks ago. I'm not going to use that one. But how many has ever met Freddie? Freddie is a pride and joy. He's not a baby, but he might be. But Freddie, Freddie, Freddie has a problem. He has separation anxiety. <laughs> How many ever had a shih tzu? A small dog of any kind. You ever heard of separation anxiety? When you get away from them, so when we leave the house every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, we put him in a cage, not a big dog, we put him in a cage, and uh, leave because we don't, he's going to tear the house. We like <laughs> don't want that. So, Put him in a cage, we turn on the music for him so it's nice and comfortable. We have a fan there just in case he gets too warm. Have a heater in case he gets too cold. He, we don't spoil him, but I'm just telling you. But when we leave, he does something every time. He howls. He sounds like a wolf out of there. Oh! I mean, I, I, just, I don't know how a little dog can do that and how he can do it so long. And knowing he does it sometimes when I'm just in my office, he wakes up and I'm not by him. I'm in my office here at the house. He'll go, oh, I don't know. And I said, Freddie, get his attention. And he, he still does it. But after a few minutes, he sounds asleep. I hear him snoring. I mean, you know, this dog, he, he's a character. Anybody want to chip chip? 
Uh, anyways, but when we come home, sometimes I'm there, Miss Donna's down at the church, and I've got him all settled down. He's in his case, he's sleeping, snoring, helping me write my sermons. Not knowing he's going to be in them. <laughs> but when Miss Donna hits the garage door open, He perks up. <laughs> and he looks at me like, what's that? And all of a sudden, he starts turning flips. And uh, I pop the cage door open. And uh, she knows to don't open the man door on the garage until the main garage door is open or closed. But he hears it, and he just goes nuts. You see, he was expecting her. He was expecting her. You know, when you know something's going to happen, when you believe something's going to happen, you're excited about it. You expect it. And, you know, you work hard for your paycheck, and you expect to get paid on Fridays. <laughs> or, you know, whatever your payday is. And, uh, we can expect something from God. So a, a few years ago when I came, that verse began to play in my heart. And I went down and got this side made. How many remember? We did. Amen. <laughs> and we still expect God. Amen. We've only got three people that remember it. <laughs> but some of you were here. How many were not here then? See? We're glad to have you. <laughs> but you, did you come expecting this morning? I came expecting God. And I'm already sharing a moment what you can expect from God. But I need to share one other word with you. When I go to church, I go to church with a sense of anticipation. I'm so excited to go to church. Yes. Miss Donna and I, when we drive down our little hill there coming to, to church, how many know where we live? <laughs> Good. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but when we come up, when we start the church, there's a little hill we start down. We take each other's hand. We pray for the power of God to be here today. Yeah. We pray for the peace of God, yeah. for the love of God, for the healing of God to be here every service. Yeah. We pray for everybody that walks through the doors, yeah. that God would touch them, heal them, strengthen them. Yeah. And we know, we're filled with anticipation. Yeah. We knew this morning when we got to church, God was going to do something. Yeah. God was going to change lives. Yeah. God was going to make provision for some. God was going to do something that they knew was going to happen. Amen. Now, you know, some things happen unexpectedly. But you still know that God can do things. Amen. So did you come with anticipation? Yes. I want to share a verse with you out of the book of Psalms now, my brother. Psalms 130, verse 6. My soul waits. For the Lord, more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. My soul waits for the Lord. How many knew that the sun was coming up this morning? Amen. How many was up before the sun came up this morning? I was blessed with a call at 1.30 this morning. <laughs> and can I tell you about those calls that come in at 1.30 in the morning? <laughs> I do answer them if I can get to my phone. But the way it's set up now, my phone was plugged in on my left side, and I can't move my left arm to get it. And I can't roll over and grab it with or, or hurt my arm again. 
So that's where it's going to stay for a while. <laughs> but the individual did not leave a message. I did see the caller ID, and I will call them back. But if you've got an emergency, call me. Me or Miss Donna will answer the phone. And Freddie will say hi as well. <laughs> but we wait on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31. Now, now I want to delve into that word a little bit there. Wait. Isaiah 40, 31. The King James Version says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. <laughs> How many has ever heard that verse before? Amen. We sing it around here sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Amen. They that wait upon... How many would like to hear me sing it? <laughs> I came in this morning and there was not a piece of music on my table over there. So I said, that's okay. I don't need no music. <laughs> then later they got me music. But we used to sing that song. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord. That's how we got it in our heart, in our spirit. How many came waiting this morning? Boy, do I want to explain that word for you. That means you got two minutes. That word wait is used in this verse. It's the Hebrew word kava. And I can't roll my voice like they taught us in our Hebrew class. Kava. You know, how many speak? Anyone in here speak Hebrew? Better than I do. <laughs> but it has, the word kava has actually two definitions. It has, I shared with you, a literal definition and a figurative definition. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, every word in the Bible is literal. I, I, you know, some days I just want to smack people in the head. <laughs> they come up and tell me, Pastor, and I've had people tell me, Pastor, I only believe in the literal translation, and I only listen to the new, uh, to the King James Version. And if you're not going to use that around here, I'm going to go somewhere else. You know what I tell them? Don't say it. Don't let, no, I didn't. <laughs> I said, well, we don't want to see you leave, but if you got to go, we love you. <laughs> because let me tell you something. I don't know a lot, but I know what I know. And this word is very interesting. It's a literal and figurative meaning. Well, I, I should have you, what, what in the world does that mean? We have words in the English, English language that are the same way. And I used a very obvious word to identify what I'm talking about. That word was dead. How many's ever been to a funeral? Amen. Have you ever walked by a casket and looked down in it? That is dead, okay? That is the literal definition of dead. Yes. It means to be deprived of life. That person in that grave, they're dead. Amen. We had one of the largest cemeteries in our county in Florida. Do you know how many dead people were in that cemetery? All of them. <laughs> I should credit Austin for that joke. <laughs> That's the literal definition. 
But there's another definition, a figurative definition. How many has been to, ever been to a dead church? Amen. Who said this morning? <laughs> Not today. Amen. How many feel like it's dead? How many feel dead in here this morning? Reach over and, if you see a hand go up, reach over and pinch them. We'll see how dead they are. Because I've been to a lot of funerals. I didn't want to see the dead person in there. I wanted to see them back in my home. I wanted to see them sitting around the kitchen table. I wanted to see them drinking coffee and fellowship, rocking on the front porch. That's what I wanted to see. But they were dead. But I have been to some dead churches. And that's a feature to me. But as I look at this word, kava, that word that is translated way, as in Isaiah 40, 31, the literal meaning of that word, you can look it up later, don't get on your blue Bible application right now, and look it up, because you'll miss what I'm going to say. But the word means literally to bind together like a cord. I usually use two hands for that, so it took me twice as long. <laughs> but that does not mean like, how many ever went out and gathered wood or sticks or something like that and you wrapped a rope around and you tied them all together? How many ever done that? You, that would be binding them together, right? That's not what that word means. The word means like a rope, like a cord. You won't see in the end here. How many know what I mean when I'm talking about a rope? And you start to take it apart. Is wound together. That's what that word is talking about in a figurative sense. They are, in fact, the more strands that are twisted together, the stronger the rope is. Amen? And the greater its strength is. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, a cord of three strands shall not quickly be broken. So that's what that word means. A figurative definition of comma means to wait, to hope, to expect. And that's the figurative meaning. And it has the sense of anticipation. You're waiting on something, but you're anticipating God to do it. When you come to church, wait on God. Don't wait in the foyer. Don't wait in your car. Don't wait in the fellowship hall. Wait on God. Amen. Now that could be wherever you're at, but wait on God. Amen. Expect God to do something. I got anticipation. I almost brought my literal illustration and I was going to have Austin sing it for me <laughs> anticipation I haven't remember the ketchup commercial I was going to use that and I happened to glance last night on YouTube on a program how they made ketchup I said you know what I'm not even going to bring that up today so I'm not. But you got to come with anticipation. I'm expecting God to do something. Are you? Yeah. yeah. I want to ask you, what do you expect God to do? Get us out at noon. Say again? Get us out at noon. Wow. <laughs> 
I can see he's only looking at the literal <laughs> translation there. He's no ring rich our day. I promise you, you'll be out by noon. I'm not sure which noon, but you'll be out by noon. So you have to have the spirit of expectancy. Yeah. When you come to this place, yeah. you can expect some things. What can I expect around here? You can expect the word of God to be preached. Amen. 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 You can, we're not going to sugarcoat it. I've, I've instructed Sean and my other ministers. Uh, uh, Hillary's getting ready to preach. Oh, Larry, thank you. Can I call you Larry? Okay. Larry's going to be preaching. Uh, Amika's going to be preaching. Isn't that great? Yeah. Johnson's going to be preaching. Donna's going to be preaching. We got some preachers lined up. <laughs> Donna, my wife said, Do you mean Donna Wilty? <laughs> but they're going to preach the Word of God. They're not going to sugarcoat it. Linda's going to be preaching, and I, I love when Linda shares. Uh, it's never sugarcoated. It is what thus saith God. Michael is teaching always the word of God. Never, never anything sugarcoated. <coughs> sugarcoating will kill you. How many know sugar will kill you? Right? You say, well, Pastor, you shouldn't buy into that. Well, you know, for a 40-year diabetic, you got to buy into it, you know. <laughs> but anyway, 2 Timothy 3.16 all the way through four, four. Now let me remind you in the original version, the chapters and verses were not separated. Chapter three was not separated from chapter four. It was a letter. But I'm going to read it to you. It says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. How many need all scripture? Amen. Amen. Then stop getting upset when somebody behind the pulpit or behind a lectern somewhere teaches something and they use something, a scripture that you don't agree with. Well, I don't agree with that. Anybody ever said that to you, Pat? What do you, the question, what do you tell them? Keep coming back. Keep coming back. <laughs> We're bound to hit on something you like. <laughs> we got so many ways around here, you don't like one. <laughs> All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, uh -oh, for uh, instruction in righteousness. That the man of God, who is a man of God, person of God, Thank God that you may be thoroughly furnished yeah. unto all good works. Yeah. Continuing, so, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead as the very and his kingdom. Preach the word. Yeah. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, yeah. rebuke, exhort. And with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when man will not endure a sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and they shall turn and follow fables. The time will come. We are there. Yeah. We live in a time of extreme confusion, insecurity, unsettledness. We don't know what the world, 
what the world is going to, where it's coming to. You know, I hate elections. But that's how we keep our country. So, if there's a lot of things going on out there that can make us very insecure, don't worry about this stuff. God's got it under control. Amen. It's God that's in charge of this thing, not man. It's not the president. It's not the prince. As well as uh, there is a prince, but not the one we're thinking about. In, uh, the say again. That'll work. World is this. Not a king as in England. <laughs> say again. Did you say amen? Wales? Queen. Or oh, queen. Uh, you're right. I'm sorry. They have a queen now, don't they? No. They have a king. They have a king. Somebody keep me up to date. <laughs> Somebody that's up to date. The queen died. Bless her heart. Long live the king. That's how I know. Well, King Charles is not in charge. That's right. Amen. Whoever's across the big pond, whoever's above us or below us, not, they're not in charge. Washington's not in charge. God's in charge. Heaven's in charge. His kingdom. He said about the church. How many's in the church this morning? Amen. He said he's going to build a church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against him. He's going to build his church. Not my church. Not Joel's church. Not uh, Jimmy's church. God's going to build his church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Amen. So why does Paul say to preach this word? Don't just teach it. Don't just read it. Not just share it. Not just memorialize it. But preach it. He said, yes. preach the word. Amen. What does that mean? And why is that so important? Someone said, we don't have many good preachers left. College isn't producing many good preachers. Well, you know, times change. I agree with that. Sometimes methods change. But the word of God never changes. Amen. Preaching is not just explaining or teaching. I'm not going to take the time to try to pronounce the word. Uh, but preaching. Karuja in, in the Greek. It's not just, it's different than teaching. Different words. For Timothy, uh, or 2 Timothy 1 10 to 11, Paul tells us uh, that Christ abolished death and brought life and, immortal, and immortality to light through the gospel. Verse 11, for which I all, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. They're different words in the Greek. God appointed them all. Ephesians 4 and 11. He gives us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. I don't believe he's changed. Yeah. Now, new theology has combined the words be pastors and teachers. And I got news for you, pastors can teach. But some pastors can't teach. Yeah. Did you know some pastors can't even preach? 
<laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> because there's more to pastoring than preaching. This is a small part. This is the part you see. But there's more to it than I'm wrapping it up, trust me. I'd get you out of here if I knew. <laughs> oh, my watch, I'm sorry. I got it on upside down. <laughs> it's on the wrong arm, too, so. <laughs> he appointed, he said, I was appointed for three tasks. Heralding. Announcing the truth as a preacher. Composing, preserving, transmitting the authoritative pattern of truth as an apostle. And explaining and applying the truth as a teacher. So Paul was, preaching was not just explaining or teaching. Preaching was heralding. Preaching was what a town crier does in the middle of the night. Preaching is literally heralding or exalting the urgency of the message. Hear ye, hear ye. It's what's next is going to be important. That's what the preacher will do. Expect the word of God to be preached around. Amen. Can I stop right there and you come back next week? Yeah. How many will be back next week? Boy, I, they, you guys got to throw in a, a way out. <laughs> Why do you think God wouldn't be willing for you to be in your home church? You say you're not home? Okay. Well, I understand that. You want God to take you home? <laughs> Keep it up. God's a good God. Amen. You can expect the word of God around here. This is not a social We do socialize. We don't preach a social gospel. We preach the, the truth of God's word. The best we can.